Hi, I am Stephanie Glass, and I am a Director of Product Marketing here at Clary. Today, I am excited to share with you more about revenue intelligence and how you can leverage revenue intelligence to drive your revenue operation forward. We have an exciting agenda planned for you. We are going to kick off with a welcome and introduction to the Clary cast of team members that is on the call. Then we will have our CRO, Kevin, share more about strategy and execution alignment. I will turn it over to one of our VPs of sales and our uh, Anthony Cesario and our director of product management, uh, Will Patterson, to give you a little bit of go-to-market perspective. Then I'll highlight some more about knowing what is going on and what that means in the context of revenue intelligence. And then I will turn it back over to Anthony and Will to walk through a demo of our product. So you can see exactly what that means in the context of Clary. So I wanna kick off with a few introductions. Uh, there are four of us on the call from Clary. We have Kevin Canarium, he is our CRO. We have Will Patterson, who is our Director of Product Management that is focused on the Revenue Intelligence product. We have Anthony Cesario, who is our VP of Enterprise Revenue here on the West. And then I am happy to join the call. I am Stephanie, for those of you who have hopped on in the last minute. Uh, I am a Director of Product Marketing here at Clary. So I am going to turn it over to our CRO to get us started and kick off. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, to our customers who've joined, thank you uh, for your continued uh, support. We appreciate your business and we're going to keep working really, really hard for you. For those taking a look at Clary, we look forward to partnering with you um, in the future. I'm really excited about this part of the product and I'll tell you why. Um, I'm a user and uh, these, these uh, capabilities are super valuable to me. Um, if you think about where we are in, uh, you know, in the year, right, you're either in your fourth quarter, uh, you're close to closing out your fourth quarter, or maybe you're in a, a different kind of fiscal year, but whatever you're in, you're planning and you're starting the plan for your go to market for next year. At Clary, we start our new year in February. And so we're thick in the season. And these tools and these solutions have become vital to us, but I'm not going to talk about the solution. I'm going to talk about the challenge that we all have as go to market leaders in trying to institute and implement and drive our strategic initiatives. So if you're a SaaS company, some of these might look familiar to you as strategic initiatives for next year. It could be, how do you get into new verticals and market segments, right? How, how do you have the data to help inform which ones you go in and how do you drive performance in that? Maybe you're shifting your revenue model from on-prem to cloud, cloud to consumption, how do you actually drive that process across your sales organization? Um, maybe you're introducing new product lines. So you've acquired a new company, you've acquired a couple companies, you've organically grown a new product line, which is what we're talking about here at Clary today. Um, do you understand your white space? Do you understand penetration into your accounts? And are you making progress? And last topic here in one, and look, I'm really fortunate in my role in that I get a lot to talk to a lot of go-to-market teams. I'll tell you, net dollar retention is probably the hottest topic right now, right? How do we retain our customers and how do we grow the relationships we have with those customers? Um, and how do we transform what has probably traditionally been a, hey, we call you a time of renewal, are you going to renew and make it a strategic partnership? Uh, so these are just some strategic initiatives that you might be working on that are gonna inform and be major components of your go-to-market for next year. I want us to think about this as a strategy and execution flywheel. Why flywheel? Well, flywheel is a continuous process. You set strategy, go-to-market strategy, which quite honestly is mapping to your corporate strategy. You set it, you're ready to hit the new year. How do you actually execute it? Well, I'll argue that it requires two things instrumentation and optimization. Um, may sound easy, but it's really, really hard. Um, Stephanie, next slide. So let's talk about instrumentation. So you've built the strategy and maybe your strategy is you're going into new verticals 
And maybe you've now taken 1,000 or 2,000 accounts and you've added them to existing sales reps uh, franchises, or you've created a new go-to-market team for verticals, and they now have 35 accounts each. How do you actually know that they're penetrating those accounts, that they're engaging with the right personas? Um, today, I'll tell you how you do it, because I've lived this world. You've got a spreadsheet, and your managers interrogate your reps to understand where they're spending time and if they're making progress. So strategy and execution are really hard to link without instrumentation. Um, if you have instrumentation, how do you optimize? How do you adjust based on what you're, you're sensing in the market? Um, so think about it. Maybe your new vertical is pharmaceuticals, right? And you've, you've taken a thousand accounts and you're pointing your sellers at those thousand accounts. And what you might start to see if you have the instrumentation and access to data is there's a sub-segment of that. Maybe it's med device where you're having success. Can you actually now optimize your team and pivot that capacity against med device? And can you pivot capacity from one part of the country to the other? So instrumentation and the ability to optimize based on data are super important into this flywheel. And so what we typically see and what we've all experienced in our career is it's really hard to execute on strategy when you have no way to drive it, measure it and adjust it. This is the challenge, right? That we've all been in as, as revenue folks. So what we're gonna talk about today is how do you link strategy execution and provide the foundational instrumentation data to CAV and run this continuous flywheel? Um, Stephanie, next slide. So we call this revenue intelligence, right? It's the data informing the human on making better decisions. Uh, let's talk about some of the problems we typically see in trying to implement our strategy. Next slide, Stephanie. Um, so this is the harsh reality, right? 67% of well-formulated strategies fail due to, due to poor execution. How many has been in, in big companies where the go-to-market for the new year was going to be having an entire specialist sales organization that was going to overlay the field? How did we know that they were actually effective versus just following what was already being done by the core team? How much time was spent trying to understand the data and reporting, you know, maybe a, a parallel forecast, maybe uh, trying to uh, figure out was the strategy working and did we need to pivot before it was too late, right? And in a lot of companies, you kind of snap the chalk at the beginning of the year, hope that you have the right strategy and hope that you have the right execution. It's not until the end of the year that you know if you succeeded or failed. Next slide, Stephanie. So let's, let's kind of walk through this. Um, and let's start with that frontline sales manager. And, you know, what, what is the job that we ask the frontline sales manager to do? Quite honestly, probably the hardest job in selling because what have you asked them to do? You've asked them to hire, onboard, coach, be a part of the deals, submit an accurate forecast, and they spend most of their time reporting the news, right? We've all gotten a spreadsheet from our boss that has 15 columns of things they wanna fill out to understand are we tracking against the KPI or the strategy they've signed up for. So that manager is gonna interrogate each rep, each rep's deals, and probably spend half their time trying to get a narrative and by the time they deliver it to their boss, the data is old, right? The opportunity to adjust has already passed. And you've taken this uh, very expensive, very important asset, the manager, and you spent all the time just reporting the news. So in the evolution, we kind of come to data-driven. If you can now capture the data on what's happening and give that data to your manager, how valuable is it? Because now they don't actually have to spend all their time getting to the data, understanding the data. And as we evolve even more, what if they can use that data to be forward thinking? For instance, maybe your manager is seeing in the data that one rep is totally penetrated against their, their territory and can't keep up with all the opportunities that they're seeing 
And another rep who might be in a different geography is having a hard time penetrating theirs because that market might not just be ready. What if you could pivot your capacity in real time, right? Think about it. What if you could make game time decisions on capacity versus opportunity? That would be pretty telling. What if you could see how your reps were ramping and based on how they were ramping, you could adjust your enablement plan based on what you're seeing happening in the field. So you start to pivot your manager from interrogation and reporting the news to being data-driven and forward-looking. Now you have an opportunity to help them be strategic, which is gonna help you be strategic, which again is gonna help you measure, monitor, and adjust your strategic growth initiatives. So what we really wanna spend our time today talking about with you is how do you move from reporting the news to being strategic? How do you instrument your strategic plans, measure, monitor them, and adjust them in real time? So to do that, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Cesario. Anthony runs our enterprise business, um, and he's going to talk to you about how he leverages these and, and to give you a real go-to-market perspective. Anthony, over to you. Great. Thanks, Jeff. L looking forward to it. I'm, I'm going to tag team with, uh, with Will uh, uh, on this uh, from our product team. Yes, looking forward to it. So the, the first step in this transformation from reporting the news to being strategic is understanding where you are today. Um, to help us do this, we're going to take a look at some benchmarks for B2B companies like yourselves that might be top of mind as you're going through the annual planning process. So Clary analyzes hundreds of millions of sales activity data points every year. Uh, and that gives us a really interesting perspective on the true state of go-to-market organizations. Um, I'm going to represent the data side of things here, but Anthony can actually tell you what impact this stuff has on the business, what this really looks like in practice. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and, ahead and dive in and let's start with the relatively simple one, which is how many accounts a rep can actually manage on an annual basis. Again, this is probably something that all of you are thinking about as you carve out territory sizes uh, in the sample that we found, we looked at 12 months of data, looked at the number of different accounts that a rep is actually having meetings with, right, as a proxy for having meaningful level of engagement with that account. We found that the average seller meets with about 32 different accounts uh, in an annual basis. You know, we know that this can vary widely even within one business, let alone across businesses. So we do, we're also thinking about this a little bit from a segment perspective, so differentiating the typical enterprise rep from the typical mid-market or commercial rep. Obviously those definitions are different in every business, but gives you a high level understanding of how this, how this breaks down across different go-to-market motions. Definitely some differentiation there. You know, you're seeing mid-market reps having to cast a slightly broader, broader net at lower ASPs, maybe lower conversion rates, enterprise reps going deeper, but honestly less of a spread than I would have expected personally. So uh, first of all, Anthony, what's your take on this? Like, how, how do these numbers strike you? Are they high? Are they low? Does that sound about right based on your experience? Yeah, um, you know, th th they look about right to me, honestly. Uh, I really think, obviously, this is driven by the, the solution that, that your team is selling. Um, if, if you are selling something much more, you know, very transactional, this, this might go up a bit. But in most of the customers that we work with, you know, you look at, you know, fairly strategic sales that are happening and um, that's correlated with a, a large investment that companies are being asked to make. And especially in this environment uh, right now, the, the amount of people that um, uh, or the uh, amount of due diligence that has to go into that selling process um, is probably exponentially higher than it, than it, than it was, you know, several years ago. Buyers are much more educated, right? They are expecting you to come with a point of view on their business and, and help them think about the things that, that they don't already know. And to do that, right, it's hard to formulate a, a strong point of view on, on more than you know, 30 or 40 companies in a single year. It's just the, the things that we're asking our reps to do, um, be it in mid-market or enterprise, is... Um, it's hard to take on a whole lot more than that with, with a, a strategic sale. So obviously driven by, by, by the product, um, but this looks fairly consistent. You know, like Kevin talked about, we, we, when you look at the um, kind of the go-to-market strategy, uh, you know, we look at the numbers and you try to work backwards and figure out what, um, how much revenue can we deliver per rep 
and you know you take the mid market for example right you have you have 40 40 opportunities that that you're running throughout the year um maybe um that, that's about 10 a quarter you know maybe 60 percent of them make it past phase one or phase, you know stage one stage two you know most of our customers have about 30 percent conversion rate so you're seeing you know maybe two three opportunities closing a quarter let's call it 75k in opportunity so this is pretty consistent, right? You're talking, you know, each rep is delivering somewhere between half a million and a million dollars a year in revenue with, with these kind of numbers. So I think this is this is pretty accurate. Yeah, it's really interesting how you can do the back of the napkin math and and work your way back to uh, to how much how much coverage a rep really needs. So to that point, how how should this kind of benchmark factor into your account and territory planning? Like, how how do you take this knowledge into account when you're carving up territories? Yeah, you know, I think Kevin, you know, hit it on the head. It really starts with what is your go-to-market strategy, right? Um, are, are you, um, it's going to be dictated by your TAM, obviously, you know, your addressable market, but are you looking to, you know, in the next fiscal year, are you looking to completely saturate, you know, uh, a certain segment of you know, ICP accounts, ideal customer accounts? Um, if that's your strategy, right? That, that might dictate, you know, how you think about this. Are you looking to just stack up logos and, and, and really go far and wide and as many logos as you, as you can pull in? And that, I think the latter is one that, you know, becomes is where accounts start to slip through the cracks because you might say, hey, I'm going to give a rep 150 accounts and go, you know, to go after. And we know that they're only going to be able to meaningful, meaningfully touch 30 or 40 of those um, th th that could affect your headcount plans, right? That could affect how you segment your, your business. So, um, yeah, I think it starts with, with the go-to-market strategy and then, and then knowing what the capacity is of each rep. Yeah, let's, let's pivot to that topic of things slipping through the cracks and, and take a look at the other side of the coin here. So the next, the next benchmark that we analyzed is the portion of a rep's book of business that's going untouched every year. Um, so in this case, we're looking at accounts that had no activity at all, no, no meetings, not even an outbound email within the last 12 months. And what we found is that the average rep uh, has 77% of their patch that falls into this category of kind of sitting there dormant. Uh, and again, a little bit of variation across enterprise and, co and commercial or mid-market, as you might expect, but overall, a really high number of, of accounts that are slipping through the cracks. So First of all, what, what impact does this have on the business at the end of the day? Yeah, so there's probably two people cringing right now, right? Most of the sales managers out there look at this and think, holy smokes, right? We, this, is, this is bad. We need to do a better job. The marketing team's probably looking at this saying we're, we're pumping a lot of work into these accounts, right? We, we want to make sure you guys are touching them. Um, I think the real answer is uh, th this can mean nothing. Right. If, if you gave your ref 200 accounts and the, the go to market plan for the year was for them to penetrate a certain segment of those, that this, this number could be um, could be meaningless. Uh, I, I, you really have to focus on on the right metrics as you look at this kind of data. Um, but I, I think that the key takeaway is to Kevin's point, you, you need the visibility um, and the instrumentation to, to be able to pivot and, and adapt. If the if the team is not executing on the strategy that, that we built for the year, right? So if if these if if there's um if this is 77% of of the the key you know key accounts that we need these reps to get into that aren't being touched, you know you need to make some adjustments obviously. Um, but if um, if they're doing a great job penetrating the the segments that that we're, that we're focusing them on. Um, you know, th this might be a whole other question on how do we think about these accounts that we don't really want them touching? Do we, should we even put them in their territories or is that just kind of confusing them and muddying the waters? It becomes, you know, a, a partnership with the sales leaders and, and the, uh, the sales ops team to, to figure out some of those questions. Yeah, that's great. You did, did a great job of answering my second question, which is, so what do you actually do about it? And I think the reality is it's, it's more nuanced. You really need to understand not just what the, what the coverage is at a high level, but where you are and are not uh, engaged against the accounts that really matter, uh, which again requires that level of instrumentation that that many businesses don't have. So let's drill down to a slightly more granular level and talk about what it takes to build successful relationships at the individual account level. Um, I think you know we we've all heard a lot of discussion in the space around changes in buying group dynamics uh, over the over recent years. Um, what we're seeing in the data 
is that even in deals under 50K, which in, in an enterprise context might be considered you know, higher velocity or transactional, it still takes seven people on average to, to get a deal done, right? So that's seven different external stakeholders getting involved throughout the buying process. Um, and where you see this really tick up is when you get above the 250K threshold into what would you know, we'd consider full-blown enterprise selling where that number approaches 20, 20 different external people uh, in order to, to get a deal done in that category. So I guess, Anthony, add a little bit of color to this. How, in your experience, do buying group dynamics change as deal sizes go up? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think the data, you know, data doesn't lie, right? So um, it, it, the data is telling us that uh, there's there's probably more people that that are, you're interacting with in, in the buying process than you might even be aware. Um, you know, seven people on an under 50k deal, you know, might might be shocking. Just like 19 might be as well. Um, but you know, I, I think the um, I think this uh, this these numbers have gone up in recent history, um, for sure. There, there's way more scrutiny on budget right now. Um, you know, finance teams are being introduced into every single sales cycle if they weren't already. Um, so this, um, we, we certainly see this in our business that that you know that this spread looks pretty pretty consistent, um, and we, we think it'll it'll probably hold. Um, you, you'll continue to interact with more personas in in, in the buying process. Yeah. So what do, what do sellers need to do to account for this? And what are some of the common mistakes that you see are, are being made? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, this this visibility um, into relationship insights is is maybe the most important signal that there is on the health of a deal. And it's probably been the hardest thing that, that I've ever tried to get a perspective on in my career as a seller or as a sales leader. It's just really, really hard to get a handle on this. Um, so when, when you think about what this is telling you, right, there's, there's seven um, stakeholders, right, that, that, that are interacting with these deals. There's 20 stakeholders that are interacting with these deals. That's exactly what they are. These are people that have a stake in whether or not uh, they're, they're going to go with your solution to solve their problem. And, you know, as a, as a seller, you have to, you know, you have to go into that, that sales cycle and build your strategy knowing who those personas are, right? Those 10 people aren't, aren't going to, aren't going to vary a whole lot from deal to deal, right? At least not their personas. So how do you, as a sales leader, um, you know, help the rep think about deal strategy in a way that they're covering all their bases. You know, I think most of us who've sold could go back to deals, the biggest deals they've lost and point to the, the org chart and say, that's the person I missed. And, um, you know, sellers need to, to think about that in their strategy and leaders need to think about how do you coach around this stuff? Yeah, that's great. Well, Anthony, thank you for your perspective on this. Really, really uh, enlightening. Uh, I think it gives you, a, when you start to look at some of these benchmarks, it gives you a good sense for the visibility that revenue intelligence can provide into what's really going on in your business. So to talk a little bit more about that concept and what revenue intelligence is all about, I'm going to transition it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Anthony and Will for sharing what the data looks like and what it can look like when there is uh, uneven uh, mix between strategy and execution at companies. So how do you know what's going on? Unfortunately, for many years, it has been challenging to track what is going on in your business. You have all of this information siloed in different teams, and there really is a disconnect between what is happening and what the data and your insights are showing. So this is where revenue intelligence comes in. Revenue intelligence really is what enables teams to understand what execution looks like in real time at every level of their business, whether they're talking about deals, reps, or even the forecast. They're able to know what those interactions are, know that the data they have is true, and then really drive execution based on these accurate insights and drive the business forward. This is where you can really start to see that alignment between your strategy and execution at these companies. And when you have that alignment between your strategy and your execution, it can be really powerful because these plans that you put so much work into creating at the end of the year 
are actually executed throughout the year. And at the end of the year, you aren't faced with a surprise where you've missed your plan simply because you didn't have the tools to hit it. And throughout the year, you can ensure that you're on track and making adjustments as needed to really adhere with your strategic goals and make sure you're hitting those initiatives like the ones that Kevin talked about earlier in this presentation. So where do you want these execution insights? Traditionally, execution insights have been siloed, as I mentioned, but you really need all of your insights for every level of your business in a single place. For example, if you're looking at execution insights for your business at a high level, you might be asking, am I going to hit my revenue goals? But you can't make that decision without knowing what is happening all the way down to the account level. You need to know, are you assigning the right territories? Are you focusing on investing in the right territories? And are you making sure that all of your reps are on track across your teams and supporting them in the way they need to be supported? There's usually a disconnect here when you're having everyone work in a silo because you don't have visibility into what their interactions look like with both prospects and customers. You don't know if they're hearing back from them. You don't know if they're setting meetings, sending emails. And if you don't have this data at your fingertips, you're unable to get insights into what the business looks like so you can mature your relationships with each and every one of your accounts and opportunities. In addition, it's important to know what's happening for your accounts. Accounts have a long lifespan with most companies from when they are a prospect all the way through to when you're trying to expand in those accounts. And you should be following the interactions with those accounts at every stage whether those interactions are with marketing, sales, or customer success. So you're able to have a seamless experience with those accounts as you're pushing towards progress against your strategic initiatives. Now, all of this information is only as valuable as the ability to use it and bring it into your execution. You can have insights that you pull together at the end of the year, put in your plan, but then they usually don't end up getting executed on because everyone keeps operating in the same way that they have worked every year. And the reason they operate in that way is it's the best way they can operate. But you need to understand what is happening at each of these levels really to drive your strategic initiatives forward. So when you have these insights, you really need to put them to work. And in order to put them to work, you need to bring them into your operational cadences. So let's take an example here. If you have a rep who's only engaged with 50% of top accounts, which might sound pretty good after Anthony and Will called out the reps typically have 77% of accounts unengaged, you might wanna figure out how do you get more of those top accounts engaged? This is where you would bring it into your operational cadence, react to those insights and drive execution forward in your one-on-ones, your account reviews, in those regular cadences that you're having. Then you are able to take action. You can reassign untouched accounts. Maybe you can hire additional headcount to make sure your top accounts get coverage. And you're really building out your business in the space that you want to build it out in. This is really powerful. And it is very hard uh, to find a solution where you're able to both have the insights for all of these levels of the business, and you're able to also leverage that product to really drive forward these cadences and actions so your team can be successful. And you're not faced with surprises, but you have predictability for your revenue and your business. I'm really excited to turn it over to both Will and Anthony again to share a little bit more about what this can look like. So I am going to switch the control over to Will so he can dive into a demo of our product. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so let's take a look at what revenue intelligence looks like in action, uh, specifically through Clary's new account engagement module. And I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit of the demo here as the product guy, but I'm going to bring Anthony back to give us the street level perspective on how this really helps him and his team both lay out their strategy as part of the annual planning process, but really operationalize that in every touch point, whether that's a weekly one-on-one, -on -one, a QBR, a forecast call from there on out. Um, so, so let's start here. You know, we're, we're talking annual planning. Uh, we're, we're thinking about reps overall books of business, where they're, 
uh, where they have coverage and where they don't. And let's start with this, this rep coverage, uh, account coverage view that account engagement can provide. But before I do that, I just wanna talk a little bit about what, what Clary account engagement and what revenue intelligence overall is doing uh, from a product point of view. So what you're looking at here, uh, and this is just one of the many capabilities that Clary's revenue intelligence offering includes, you're looking at a team, uh, in this case, representing a, a first line manager like Anthony's, all the reps in his team, and all of the accounts that they own in CRM. Um, so we're, we're integrating with your CRM system. We're bringing in this foundational information about teams, the accounts they own, the deals they're working within those accounts. You know, CRM is still the foundation for understanding what's going on in your business. However, as we've been talking about throughout the discussion today, it, it alone provides a very incomplete picture of what's actually going on in your business. And that's where Clary's revenue operations platform augments this by tapping into directly to some of these other systems that contain really valuable insight uh, into what's going on in your business, right? So meetings that are coming directly from the calendar and Gmail or Exchange, emails that are coming directly uh, from the inbox, uh, attachments that are being sent back and forth, marketing automation signal, all of this data is brought together and put in the context of your business and your go-to-market motion and your operational cadences. That's what Clarity Revenue Intelligence is all about. And the best part of it is it does all of this without the reps having to enter any of this data manually. Uh, so leadership gets the insights that they need and, and sales reps get to focus on what they do, which is selling, selling your product. Um, so, so the view that we're looking at here is, you know, let's say you're, you're looking back at, uh, at the last quarter, maybe in a QBR context, thinking about what's coming in the year ahead, how many accounts each of your reps own and what portion of those accounts they actually engage with, uh, across different systems. This is some of the, some of the insight that powered those benchmarks that we're looking at earlier. Um, so in a, in an annual planning context, one thing you might be thinking about here and Anthony, I, Anthony and I have had a number of conversations about this is how do you actually assess whether a rep has enough market to go after? Uh, and understanding the current state of their account coverage is a really important part of doing that, um, which again is really hard to do if you don't have full visibility into where they're engaged and where they're not, which as we've talked about, doesn't come from CRM alone. So Anthony, how do you actually assess whether a rep has enough market to go after as you're doing your, your annual planning? Yeah, um, this is a really, really important question. Um, I'm a pretty firm believer that if you want to build a world-class team, if you want world-class sellers on your team, you, you have to have territories that are both fair and, and equitable, right? People need to know, we need to know that we're giving our reps an opportunity to go overachieve, hopefully, and we also need to know that there isn't going to be reps looking at each other thinking they have, they have a territory that's, that's way better than mine, right? You, you really have to, um, to get into the data to do this right. Um, so I, I honestly will, um, if you don't mind, I, I live in this part of the product. If you don't mind going to the grid view here, um, yeah. I, I actually live in this. I look at it all the time. Um, and, and I'm looking at Okay, um, first, what does territory equity look like, right? So clearly Michael has 215 accounts that, that looks, it just jumps out at you as different from everybody else. Um, but I start looking at, okay, what are, um, how well are the reps penetrating their book of business? You know, I can see that Michael, you know, he's, he's engaged with 26% of his account base in the last quarter, you know, 32% have sent him, have sent him emails, right? So, you know, I look at a couple of things, right? Um, one, I can see what the capacity is of the reps, which you showed earlier in those slides, right? How many accounts realistically can we expect them to engage with? If there's a big delta on the other side of that, that tells me that maybe there's an opportunity to, to build more headcount into the plan, right? Um, if we're looking at, at a segment of the business where we want every one of these accounts touched, right? On the flip side, I might go in and start putting some filters on this and, and thinking about certain segments of the business saying, okay, let me look at, you know, all of my priority one accounts, or let me look at a certain industry that I care about, how well have we penetrated that industry? 
you, Kevin mentioned going to verticalization, right? Let's look at how well we've penetrated verticals. Is there someone who's been really great in a certain vertical? Let's think about maybe, you know, using them as a, as a guinea pig for the vertical team, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of things you can do from a go-to-market planning perspective just by having kind of this level of, of visibility and um, thinking about how you want to focus the capacity of your reps on, on, on the right, you know, the right accounts. Yeah, so that, let's talk about that concept of focusing your capacity specifically from the lens of account prioritization. Uh, and to start off with, can you talk a little bit about how you approach account prioritization with your team? Yeah, for sure. So we, we do a uh, we do kind of a top down and a bottoms up approach. As a go to market team, we we look at you know we do overall kind of TAM analysis, right? So if Will scrolls down to the bottom here, I, I can see that you know there is um, there is uh, you know 118 accounts that we've engaged with, right? So I start looking at some of these totals and think about that, and I, I, I um, we'll start with okay, what is our overall addressable market? And we'll look at that um, first from a um, from an industry analysis, right? An ideal customer kind of fit analysis, top down, and that gives us a sense of our general overall market. And then we do a bottoms up prioritization as well, where we start prioritizing what are the accounts based off of this year's go to market motion, this quarter's go to market motion that we want the reps most focused on, and we use uh, things like this, right? P1, P2, P3 to, to help focus the reps. So you know, this year we said, hey, team, we want 100% penetration in the P1s and we want you penetrating your top five or 10 P2s, right? That's, that's the charter this year. And, um, and then that becomes much easier to measure, right? I can, I can switch to that view and, you know, Michael's list of 200 accounts might go down to uh, 40 accounts, right? And, and now it's, it's, I can see of the things that we're asking Michael to do, penetrate these 40 accounts he's only penetrated five of them right so th this is a whole different conversation and then when i was looking at his whole book of business and he'd gotten into you know um several of the other you know prioritized accounts so th that's how we think about it well yeah no that's super helpful and just to talk a little bit about what we can do from the product perspective here when we're applying this this p1 filter really what clary can do is it can take any of these any of these aspects of how you segment your business, whether it's verticalization, prioritization, you know, new product entry, we can take these things and reflect them in the insights that we show you in Clary and really map these views to the way that you structure your go-to-market. That's where a lot of the, the power of Clary really comes into play is being able to take all of this engagement insight that we can, that we can gather automatically and hone it to the specific way that you as an organization look at your business. So in this case, Anthony's really driving his team around uh, his priority one accounts. Uh, you know, you've, you set a high bar there, Anthony. You're expecting 100% coverage of those P1s through because you went through that rigorous inspection process. That is a high bar. How do you actually, how do you hit it? Uh, what, do you, what do you do as a first line sales manager to actually get your team to 100% coverage of those top priority accounts? Yeah, you, you have to build it into your, your operating cadence, right? So uh, we've made it part of our DNA. Um, the the uh, it starts off in our QVPs, our quarterly business planning meetings, right? Where our reps, you know, and, and we just had ours two weeks ago, right? Our reps start off and they start their their QVP in this view that you're looking at here, filtered for their P1 accounts, and they talk about, hey, what is a we can put a filter on here and say, hey, what what are the what are the accounts that that I haven't had meetings with? What, what are the ones that I have? And um, we'll we'll talk about what have we done with the rev dev team, right? The, the BDR team to, to try to penetrate some of these accounts, right? Um, what are the strategies we're using? How can you use help from, from e staff or the board to try to penetrate some of these accounts? Um, and so we, we, we constantly uh, talk about it. It starts with the QBPs, then it goes to the, the weekly one-on-one. So we have in our, in our one-on-one -on -one dashboard, we have widgets built that, that are showing what, um, what are the, the P1s that we've engaged with in, in the last week? What, um, and what are the accounts that we haven't engaged with in the last month? And we're just constantly talking about that and, and talking strategy and, and how, you know, how I can be helpful uh, as they try to penetrate those accounts. Yeah, so I think, Anthony, this is the type of view that you're talking about when it comes to actually operationalizing these insights. This is the kind of thing that you're looking at in your weekly one-on-ones. In addition to providing those team-level insights, we can also provide account-level insight. 
Um, and think of this as your kind of real-time view of everything that's going on in, in a rep's account. Um, and, and again, it's combining data from the CRM system as your system of record with the, the engagement that's actually taking place between the rep and the customer. So you get this real-time view of where they're spending their time and equally importantly, uh, or more importantly in this conversation is where they're not spending their time. So uh, it, we talked about, you know, you've got Michael, he's only engaged with five of his P1s in the last quarter. The first thing that you want to be able to do is hone in and see which of those P1s he hasn't touched at all, right? And that's where Clary enables some really powerful stuff when we layer on this engagement filtering. So I can see at any level of the business with any combination of uh, filters to reflect these segments that you really care about, what are the accounts that don't have a certain type of engagement? So in this case, let's look at Michael's P1 accounts that he didn't have a meeting with last quarter. Uh, Anthony, put kind of put me in the shoes of, of the discussion <laughs> you're having with a, a rep on, on a weekly basis. Like I think one thing that comes up a lot is you're, uh, when it comes to automated tracking of sales activity data, is it, it's not about this isn't about the stick. It's not about uh, Big Brother. You're ultimately trying to help the rep, right? How do you ha how do you drive those conversations in a way where it doesn't feel like you're beating the rep up about not talking to these accounts, but you're actually helping them be successful? Yeah, I'm, I'm already I'm going into to uh, one on one mode here. I'm looking at the data, thinking, oh, there's there's an opportunity. Yeah, so th this is great, right? Um, some important stuff to call out here. Um, one, you know, the interface of CRM data, marketing data, and activity data is wildly important here. So what I'm seeing, when you see intent buying score, for us, that's six cents, right? We, we have a, a six cents score inside of here. And I can see that Apple is a P1 account. We have an open opportunity on it. The six cents data is telling me that this is, you know, they're in a purchase uh, phase right now, right? Meaning they're, they, are, they are out in the market seeking to, to buy a solution based off of all the great you know, um, marketing uh, data. And um, the, obviously a great logo, you want to go after this, no meetings out there. And, you know, we're looking at the last quarter, right? Only 10 emails have been sent to this company in the last three months, even though there's an open opportunity there. I want to drill into the details. I want to go look at the activity in the account. I want to go figure out what's happening, right? Um, who are we meeting with? Are we single threaded or multi-threaded? Um, what, what is it that's keeping us from being more engaged in, in a company that's clearly looking to purchase something that's a priority account for us and that we say there's an open opportunity on? Um, so that, that's, that's the first thing I'm looking at is, okay, what are the accounts that have opportunities on them and, and why aren't we getting more traction? Is this inflating my pipeline? And there's only two of them here that, that have open ops. Um, then I'm looking at what is the biggest addressable accounts in here? Um, and let's say that your product is based off employee count, right? So then, then I can start honing in on, you know, the Walmarts of the world and the United Health Groups and saying, hey, th th these are 500,000 licenses we can sell, right? W what can we do to get put creative messaging in place? How do we partner with RevDev and marketing and the ABM team to, to go get them to start responding to our emails and, and scheduling meetings with us? So, that's how we try to encourage our reps to, to think like the head of their own franchise, think like, you know, the, the go to market leader for their business and, and take a step back and, and strategize around how to penetrate these accounts. Yeah, that's great. And la last question that I'll ask here as we're going through the demo before I uh, transition to showing you something uh, exciting uh, that I think relates to a lot of the discussions we've had today which is just if you were to summarize the the before and after of you know trying to drive execution of account based strategies before having access to insights like this versus after having insights like this like how how would you characterize that that transformation Oh wow I and, and this is this is not selling this is very real I, I I don't know how I would be able to do my job going forward without the, the instrumentation that I have now I can pretty confidently say that um, the amount of effort and calories that went into doing this kind of analysis in my past life, uh, only to realize now how stale the data was when I was all ultimately done building my spreadsheets and stuff. It's just, um, you know, it, it feels like, you know, moving from corded phones to wireless, like you, you'll just never go back once you have this kind of instrumentation. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's um, it's made us better coaches because we're focused on on the right the right deals and the right parts of those deals that, that we need to help with. 
It's made us better go to market leaders, right? Because we can build fair and equitable territories and and better execute on on our go-to-market strategy, right? It's helped us better predict revenue because we're focusing the capacity, the whole company on on the right segments. Like there's just so much that goes into this level of instrumentation. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure what I'd do without it at this point. Hopefully uh, from here on out, I'll always have it, I, I think. That's a great answer. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, so let's let's transition over to one more thing uh, that I want to share with you today before we wrap things up here and I hand it back over to Stephanie. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Give me one second here. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, So one more thing that I'm really excited to share with you today, you might have noticed a common theme in a number of the discussions that we've been having throughout the webinar, which is the importance in enterprise selling of understanding the person level relationships that you have in the accounts that really matter to making your strategy successful. So uh, that's why we're really excited to share our latest revenue intelligence offering, which is coming very soon. Uh, and we call it Relationship Insights. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about what Relationship Insights is designed to do and how it fits into this whole picture. Um, So Anthony and I walked you through how you can use account engagement to get a high level picture of how your team is actually managing their book of business, which again is typically a big gap in uh, creating that flywheel effect between strategy and execution. If you don't have the right instrumentation into which accounts are being worked and which ones are not. You can't make pivots on the fly that allow you to optimize the strategy and create that positive feedback loop. Um, but as you as you get to that next level of detail, and as Anthony just walked through in a one-on-one setting, maybe you hone in on an important opportunity or an important account rather that has an opportunity that maybe isn't seeing the traction that you'd expect understanding who you're talking to and who you're not talking to in that account is really where uh, the rubber meets the road. And if you come back to the fundamental problem that revenue intelligence is solving for, historically, sales teams have had to turn to their CRM system to answer those kinds of questions, right? You know, through through the contacts that you have in the system. But I think what, what you find more often than not is that like understanding which accounts you're engaging in and which ones are going untouched, CRM doesn't do a very good job of telling you what relationships you're actually building in every account. And it comes back to this fundamental underlying problem, which is it's only as good as the data that your reps put into it. And you know, in our opinion, it's not the best use of any sales reps time to be manually entering every contact that they meet with, every interaction they have with those people and revenue intelligence is really designed to be a better way to solve that problem. It's designed to give you the insights to answer those questions while, while leveraging the power of AI and automation. Uh, so the rep doesn't have to lift a finger, but managers get the instrumentation that they need to inspect. So you know, let's say in this context, Anthony, Anthony and I are having the one-on-one. We want to drill into what's going on in Walmart. It's a, it's a big account. We've got a large open opportunity. Uh, rather than trying to hunt down this information in CRM or rather or more likely hunt it down via word of mouth, I can drill in and see a full picture of the relationships that we're building uh, based on real-time engagement data. Uh, so what this is doing is it's taking all of those meetings and email exchanges that we're having with the Walmart account, extracting all of the insights about who's involved in those communications and using that data, presenting it in a way that makes it really easy to answer some of the most common questions that sales leaders like Anthony have been asking for years. The starting at the high level with things like, are we single threaded or multi-threaded in the account or in the account? Or in other words, are we focusing all of our all of our attention on building one relationship with one stakeholder? Or are we actually going broad and building the broad base of support that we need to drive the success that you saw on that slide earlier? Again, remember seven account, seven contacts, even in deals under 50K, up to 19 in in deals over 250K. Uh, So in this case, I want to see 
that my rep Stephanie is actually going out and engaging with the full range of people needed to be successful. So, you know, highest level, okay, check the box. She's talked to 12 different people. That's good. Uh, but the next level is who are you actually talking to and, and who's been most engaged? So what Relationship Insights does is based on all of that, uh, based on all of that engagement data, it automatically surfaces the top people that we've been talking to in those accounts. Shows me who they are in terms of their title. Um, you know, is this a is this a C level executive or uh, or an individual contributor? Uh, and it also gives me a summary of the engagement statistics with that person. When's the last time we talked to them? Right, you're you're looking out for potentially key st stakeholders that have had large gaps in the engagement. Do you have an upcoming touch point with them? Do you have a next meeting scheduled? And it also makes it really easy for me to access all of the recent communications with the with those stakeholders, meetings they attended, email exchanges that they were a part of, file exchanges that they were a part of. Uh, so it takes all of that data that normally I would have had to hunt around for and makes it available at my fingertips. So all of a sudden it's changing the inspection conversation uh, because you actually have access to the insights that you need. The, the next part of this is it's no longer just about understanding who you're talking to on the buying side. It's actually really critical to understand which internal resources you have involved as sales teams build themselves out to uh, be to provide all the right resources to be successful, right? So you've got product specialists, you've got overlays, you've got executive sponsor programs. Uh, you know, maybe you're even getting the product management team involved to to talk roadmap. Understanding not just how you're working the buying team on the stakeholder side, but how you're leveraging your internal resources is also a critical component of inspection um, that allows you to really understand whether you're doing everything you can to make this relationship successful. Um, the second aspect of that is when it, comes to, when it comes to the rep being able to track down people that have the, the relevant knowledge to, to, to get things done in their accounts, sometimes it's, it's kind of tribal knowledge in the sense that they need to, they need to invest a lot of research research time to find people that may have valuable information that can help them again get things done in their accounts whereas again here uh, that's available at my fingertips i can see who's been involved lately so i know who to reach out to if i have a question as a seller um, and the last thing that i'll touch on here as we get you know down to the most surgical level in inspecting what's what's going on in the account relationship we've seen over the last six to nine months uh, companies really, really get focused on the personas that matter in getting deals done. And a very common one, uh, a very common one in that context is the finance persona um, as budgets have gotten tighter. So what, what account, engage, uh, account engagement and relationship insights allows you to do here is be very specific, search for those key personas that really matter for your business and surface easily uh, whether or not you've seen the engagement from, from that critical persona in this critical account pursuit. Uh, so now we've gone from instrumenting the business at the top level, understanding how, uh, how a rep is working their entire book of business, all the way down to whether they're talking to a specific individual that's critical to making a relationship successful. So hopefully you've gotten a good sense for a few ways that Clary's revenue intelligence offerings can help you across that entire funnel and give you a better understanding of what's going on in your business. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephanie to wrap us up. Thank you for joining us for this last hour to learn a little bit more about revenue intelligence and how you can leverage it really to skyrocket your business. And we are really excited after this webinar on December 15th, we will be hosting a roundtable with Kyle Hollingsworth, a VP of sales from Sixth Sense, and Will Patterson, who has been on this call, facilitating to enable you to talk with your peers about how you are implementing or thinking of implementing revenue intelligence in your organization. If you haven't received an email already, you will be receiving one inviting you to join. It will be an interactive conversation where you can talk to each other rather than just hear from us. So we're looking forward to seeing you on that call. And thank you again for joining. Feel free to reach out to any of us anytime if you want to learn more about revenue intelligence.